Today, I wanna to have a real candid conversation about the five things that keep me up as an entrepreneur. We're gonna jump right in. Number one that keeps me up, and these are not in any particular order, um, but making sure that I am being fiscally responsible for my company. So now we do have employees. I have 18 full-time employees, one contractor, six part-time employees, and we're also onboarding two more employees. So that will bring us to about 18, 24, 26, about 27 employees. Um, and that is a lot, okay? Um, and I never thought that I would be here today with this many employees. I actually, last week, didn't even realize I had that many until we got ready to, to move for 1K vendors and I had to fill out this census data. And I actually didn't realize that, that I actually had that many people already. However, to whom much is given, much is required. I know as a believer in Jesus Christ that I am not the source for my employees in making sure that they can take care of their families. I am simply the vessel. And the Lord thought enough of little old Renarda to allow her to have these contracts to be able to have this many employees relying on us to be successful so that they can actually feed their families and, and, and pay their mortgages and pay their car payments and vacation and do all the cool things that they want to do. So number one is always making sure that there are contracts available so that we actually have revenue and that we stay fiscally responsible so that our employees can get paid on time uh, so that we can keep our employees because they do love working for us. We have a great environment. We have um, we, we don't have the best benefit package yet, um, but one day I want to be able to provide health insurance uh, for each and every person. Uh, right now we just give an allotment each month and then we give a, a twice yearly allotment where they can actually also use it almost like an HSA. So those are the type of things that you want to make sure that you have for your employees, but it's also sometimes be burdensome because you wanna make sure that you are being fiscally sound so that you do have the contracts, you do have the work, that you're performing well, so that these folks can have a dependable place that they can uh, count on to work for. So I, I'm always making moves, but at the same time, making sure I'm protecting what we have uh, so that our employees can make sure that they get paid on time. And this is not something for them to worry about, like we are fiscally sound, uh, but it is one of those things that's always in the back of your mind that are you one or two or three contracts away from, from not being able to be fiscally sound? Is there gonna be an expense that pops up and all of this uh, just blows up? So those are just the things that I have in my mind as the business owner, knowing that I have people that are counting on me in order to be able to meet their responsibilities. Number two is more on a personal note. So if there is a shortage or if there is something that occurs where we do not have the funding and the money and the contracts that we need, then the first people to get cut is actually not going to be our employee staff. The first people that's going to get cut is going to be the officer staff. And that's me and my two business partners. And that's just really how true business should go. If you know you need your workforce in order to maintain your client relationships and the contracts, but for some reason, Reason, the money is not there you do not cut your staff and that's what a lot of people do because everybody knows as a business owner your number one expense is always going to be people and that is usually where you see the biggest cuts and layoffs come is from the people but then your clients are going to suffer and so in that instance for us we wouldn't want to cut our people because we don't want our clients to suffer we would have to cut our uh, salaries or cut our distributions in order so that we can make payroll and on a personal level, I am not in a financial place where I can actually afford not to have the salary that I have, the distributions that I have, um, because personally, I'm not in the best financial situation where I could actually afford not to have income. So that's the second thing that bothers me as an entrepreneur or keeps me up, because if something did occur and the people that are gonna have to take the cut is at the officer level, I'm not financially sound in my personal uh, life to be able to afford to take such cuts. Number three is around cybersecurity. Okay, so I know we're a small business, um, but we do deal in the PHI space. And so everybody's aware of the most recent attack against Change Healthcare that is owned by United Healthcare. And I know the they have a whole lot more money than we do. Okay, and then so they're able to pay out that huge ransom. And so they did have a huge target on their back. But we also know the world that we live in, a lot of people are just evil and people do things just out of spite and people do things just to 
hurt folks for no apparent reason. I swear I think people just have too much time on their hands. If they actually use uh, this intelligence, they have to go and hack into systems into something that was actually meaningful, how much better would we all be? So it's always in the back of my mind, although we have the processes and things in place, we're SOC 2 certified, we go through annual assessments, we go through quarterly assessments, we go through all these things to make sure that we are in a good light when it comes to um, being safe with cybersecurity. But at the same time, it's always in the back of your mind. If it can happen to a behemoth uh, like Change Healthcare, then what's stopping it from occurring with smaller agencies? So that's another thing that, that keeps me up sometimes is around the cybersecurity and have we done everything that we can. And sometimes even when you do everything you can, there's always a loophole where somebody goes in and, and something happens. Number four is hiring the right people, okay? And so right now where we're at in business, it's one of those breaking points and the breaking points is hiring the right people, okay? So whenever you're in business, you're gonna have different barriers and different breaking points along the way. And one of the breaking points my business is in right now is the people. And so uh, I'm, as I, you all know, I am a 10X certified business coach. And in one of those segments uh, with Grant Cardone and Brandon Dawson, they talk about breaking points and with the revenue we're at now with the clientele we have now the part that is one of uh would be one of our weaknesses would be the right people okay and so we take pride in the people that we actually hire my team does a very good job of hiring folks and we now actually have a recruiter that we've hired that goes out and scouts talent for us and then they come in and say hey these are the people we think would be good for your team and then from there we do the next set of interviews and bring them on if they are truly a good fit however whenever you have your employees that are working remote uh, there's a different kind of trust there okay so you have to trust that people are doing what they what they say they're going to do you have to trust that people are doing what you've put out for them to do and we have a lot of metrics so we have call center metrics we have um, the messaging around in our CRM that says how many of these uh, cases have been worked today. So we have a lot of data that we can see and look at to see if somebody is being productive or not. However, as a pharmacist and as a small business owner, I used to work at, a major, at major retail pharmacies. And these folks had these metrics in place, like did you answer the phone in 30 seconds? You know, how long did you stay on the phone with somebody? How long did it take you to get a prescription out the door? Could you get it out 15 minutes or less? And I never wanted to have metrics in place that seem to be punitive or seem to not really have any reason for actually having it in place. It was just kind of like somebody just in corporate just says, hey, these are the things that you should throw out and measure people on. And it didn't really serve a purpose. And so we never really ran our business on that model. However, we're gonna have to change that. And because it goes back to the saying, what gets measured gets done, okay? And so we've noticed a dip in our productivity. I'm not for sure why, um, but there has been a dip in the productivity. So tomorrow at the staff meeting, I'm actually rolling out a performance plan where we're actually gonna have productivity metrics. Now, whenever me and our director sat down to go over what these performance metrics would look like, we looked at historical data, you know, and then we looked at how many calls should each technician be getting through in each day? How long is the average wait time when they're on the phones with pharmacies? How long do they actually stay on the phone? So what is actually feasible? And so we used all that data from when we were doing very good from a productivity standpoint to when we're not doing so good as a productivity standpoint. And we kind of taken those two and averaged them together and came out with step one tomorrow of what those productivity standards are going to be. And from there, we'll build upon it. Um, I'm not saying that people who work remote are not working to their full potential. What I am saying is when you do work remote, you have a high propensity to be more distracted than if you were in the office. Now, I am all for remote work. We right now have employees across five different states, and that's in and of itself scary, and we'll talk about that another time because when you're setting up employees in every state, there's certain things you have to have, like unemployment insurance. You've got to have the tax ID for that state. So there's a lot of stuff that goes into having employees in different states, okay? So that's in and of itself another burden. So uh, with that being said, 
going back to, to point number four of hiring the right people, there's got to be a certain trust there with these people that you are hiring. They have to be brought into and sold upon your culture and what your organization is about. Um, it's different when you're in a huge corporate environment where you may have, uh, say, 40 people in one department. And if one or two people are slacking, the other 38, if they're doing well, you probably won't notice. But when you have 24 people and every person counts, one or two people slacking really brings down the entire productivity of, of the team. And so um, you want to make sure that you're hiring the right people. And I tell you what gave me pause about this one and, I, and made me add it to the list was a couple of weeks ago, we hired an employee and you have to take a drug test in order to work for us. And the drug company will give you a donor pass and the donor pass is good for like a week, which I found out that, you know, a lot of people only have this available for like three days. OK, well, this particular person that we were bringing on board, they needed an extension because they said they didn't have a ride to actually get to the drug test. And I just find that hard to believe in the days of Uber and Lyft that somebody does not have a way to get to a drug screen. So anyways, we had to, we, we extended it. Um, that is going to change. We're not going to extend that any longer. Um, and it's just because it's not necessarily, I'm not always gonna be thinking that the worst of somebody, uh, I'm not going to say that somebody's wanting extensions because they may be trying to wait for a certain substance to get out of their system. I'm not going there. What I am going to say is it's a sense of responsibility. And if you know you've applied for a job, you know drug screens come with it, and you know that you want to take this position, then you should be responsible to do whatever actions is necessary so that you can actually um, fulfill that job requirement. So if you're already coming in and needing extensions because you can't meet your assignments, what's it going to look like when you actually start the position. So that was number four, just making sure that you're hiring the right people um, and trusting the folks that you do hire. And when you do have remote employees, one of the things you want to make sure that you do is to have certain metrics in place that you can actually measure productivity. And number five, the, the last one I have is the growth in and of itself. Like I said earlier, if you were to talk to me week before last and ask me how many employees I had, I would have said around 18. It really wasn't until I dug into it that last week because I had to, that I realized that I had way more than 18 employees. And I no longer know everybody on my team. And there was a time when I first started, it was just me and my two business partners. And I was the one making all the phone calls. I was the one getting the clients. And so it was just me. And so then we were able to hire own employees. And as we hired those folks on, I was the one doing the hiring. So I could tell you who was married, who had kids, whose husband was in the military. I could tell you all these things about my staff because I knew them personally. And now there's people on the team that I've never seen before. I've never talked to before. Uh, so tomorrow when I join the staff meeting, there, some of those folks will be the first time I actually see them on tomorrow. Now, I 100% believe in my team that actually does the hiring. I fully support my pharmacy director in hiring the right people, okay? That, so that I, that is not a complaint. That is not a qualm I have about any of this. It's just the fact that as a business owner who started it from the beginning and knowing where it is now, you have to give up some things and you're giving up the fact that you don't know everybody that works for you. And if you're an entrepreneur and you're just starting out and you're not thinking that far down the line, start thinking about it. Because if you do grow, if you do have employees, you have these personal connections with these folks, it may come a time where you don't know everybody who works for you. And some days I'm not good with that. Um, and I'm not okay with that because I don't know my people and I really do care for my people. You know, I like to know that whenever I'm out here getting contracts that it's going to help one of my employees uh, get a, a raise or the house that they want or the car that they want. Those things fuel me as an entrepreneur uh, just because that's just the nature of who I am and I actually care about the employees. I never want to get to the point where I'm such a huge conglomerate that I've got thousands of employees and I don't know who these people are and I'm no longer connected to them. And, and just being fully transparent, I don't know how that looks, okay? So if I did get to 100 employees and I don't know everybody, how can I still stay personally connected to the people without necessarily knowing who's married, who has kids, who likes to drive a, a Cadillac? I don't know if the, it'll ever get to a point where I will know those things when I got a hundred employees and I'll be personally connected to those folks. Okay. So that's just one of the things that I, I wanted to mention. And 
in conjunction with that, I was listening to a um, YouTube video that Noah Keegan did, and he interviewed the billionaire Paul Orfala, uh, and he was the one who sold Kinko's. And I found this very interesting because in the interview, uh, Paul states that there's a point where responsibility and then turns to burden. So there's a real thin line. And so right now I am having to be very responsible, of course, because I do have all these employees. I have people that are counting on me and I also have myself counting on me. I don't want to go back into the workforce and be an employee. I, I really don't want to do that. And so I'm just as vested in this for my employees as I am for myself, okay? Because this is truly my livelihood um, and I don't want to go back to work for anybody else. But he said in it, he said that it's so much pressure and that he realized that sometimes when he was in it, he wasn't as grateful because it was so much pressure to make sure that the stores, the Kinko's was performing well. And so his managers never saw it, but the executive team may have saw some of the fear uh, that he had. And the part about the responsibility versus the burden, I see that coming. Um, it's, it's, it's going from responsibility now to a burden tipping point. I'm still responsible for these people, but the responsibility then turns into a burden because you're always in this rat race of, am I staying viable? Do I have the right contracts? Am I staying ahead of the market? You know, I don't want to be the Toys R Us in the cab um, and the radio shacks and the um, blockbusters of the world who's not staying innovative and then something comes along and your entire business model is blown to shreds. Okay, so you always have to think about, am I still being relevant in the market? Am I relevant three years from now? five years from now, what do I need to be looking at to make sure that I am not just fiscally sound and safe now, but I'm fiscally sound and safe for years to come. One of the things in his interview that really stood out to me was he said the caring for him about his people got to be too much. Okay, and I know what he means by this because me and one of my employees was actually going uh, to a conference one day. We were talking about houses and, and stuff like that. And he made the comment, he was like, yeah, I, I like this really big house that I saw or whatever. He said, but I'll never be able to afford that. And I was like, yeah, I know what you mean. You know, I would really love to stay on the lake. And then it hit me. I'm like, Renarda, the reason he can't afford it is because he works for you. Like he doesn't work anywhere else. He works for you. So you have employees that want things and saying things are out of their reach, but you are the vessel for which they are actually getting their income. So I started to think, and, and, and another caveat here, my people are paid very well according to whatever is in the marketplace. It's not that he was complaining about not being paid well. Even if he was not working for me, but he was working for someplace else at his same level, his salary would be the same. So it's not that they're underpaid. The fact is they want something as much as I want something, but I need to be the one that's actually finding ways for them to earn extra income. And that you don't necessarily have to do that because some people could say, oh, well, you can go out and you can get a second job or you could go out and you could do this. But I'm the type of business owner where when I've got good people and I've got great people, how do I share in my successes with them so they can actually afford the things that they want? Because I don't want to be that business owner that's at the top, that's having all this great profits and this great dividends. And I'm out here on a boat on Lake Murray. And then I've got an employee who I could not have had my boat on Lake Murray had it not been for the employees and they can't get the house that they actually want. Okay. So that's another thing that just sits in my head is when you've got the right people, how do you keep the right people and incentivize those people and compensate those people so that they actually stay with you. I hope from all of that, what you see is this is just a very candid conversation of things that I've been thinking of lately that keep me up um, at night. And I'm not going to say keep me up at night because I do sleep well. But so those are just some of the five or six things that actually just go through my head as I'm a growing business owner, as my business is growing, as the employees are growing, the contracts are growing. So all of that is just to put it out there and say whether you're starting out 
or whether you're already getting ready to hire or you're already where, where I'm at or maybe you even have even more employees, I just want you to start thinking about what this actually looks like and what this journey looks like. And if you could drop in the comments below, let me know where you're at. Are you just starting out? Do you have um, employees already? Do you have more than 24 employees? And if you have any hints and advice for me or any of the followers, please put that below because it really is a learning curve. Um, you actually can have mentors and people to tell you what they're going through so that you don't hit those same pitfalls. And that's what this channel is about, is letting me share some of my best practices and some of the hurdles that I went through so that as you start your business and go throughout the journey, uh, you don't have to suffer the same pain and consequences. So I hope this was very helpful. Um, if it was, please don't forget to like and subscribe. So if you are a new entrepreneur and you want some ideas on how you can actually start your business and what you can use as far as customer a service as that leverage um, I suggest that you watch the next video it's called sell the need and service to sale it's all about how you can anticipate the needs of a client um, and provide great customer service uh, throughout that entire transaction so that you can have better client retention so we appreciate you and we thank you